Hello. I went to the hairdresser last week asking if they could do my hair like this. I actually showed them this photo and I asked for a trim, but I ended up looking like this. <sighs> it does look less yellow in daylight, I've discovered, so it's less overwhelming like this. Um, I mean, this might be the last time you see me looking like this because I've got a hair appointment for next week to put everything right. But at the same time, I'm starting to get used to it. So I might be used to being blonde by next week. I've been having a little break and just enjoying the countryside, you know, just um, staring at the sea until it gets dark, staring at a lake yesterday until until that got dark <laughs> just generally staring at nature and relaxing and it's been really lovely and i needed to have a break from editing at the same time otherwise it would have taken away from the loveliness i i really do hate editing um <laughs> and um i need to find an editor So today I want to look at Martin Bashir. I will be talking about Martin Bashir in relation to narcissists in this video, but that doesn't mean that I'm saying he is a narcissist, but he does have some of the traits. I think he demonstrates a sense of self-importance, a preoccupation with success, a sense of entitlement, exploitative behaviour and a lack of empathy. The reason I'm not labelling him as a narcissist is because we don't know if this has been a pattern for him. We don't know how often he's behaved like this. We don't really know how strongly he fulfills the criteria or anything about his history. He lied to Princess Diana's brother. So this was when Princess Diana was alive. It was just before her famous Panorama interview when she disclosed a lot of private stuff, a lot of things that had gone on between Prince Charles and her. And during that video, she's quite bitter. She seems quite angry. Um, and it's not surprising that she felt like that because she'd just been told that there was somebody spying on her. Martin Bashir had made the whole thing up and he'd got a graphic designer to forge um, bank transactions so that it looked like someone was being paid to spy on Diana. William and Harry have both made statements about this, talking about what a huge impact it had and how the BBC did a really bad job of investigating this. Prince William has said that the interview was a major contribution to making his parents' relationship worse. And Prince Harry has gone further than that. He's said that the ripple effect from this interview led to his mother's death. And you can see why he said that, because by the time she died, she didn't have police protection. She talked about Camilla and she talked about how Charles's relationship with Camilla had made her feel worthless. She also talked about how she'd been bulimic and she'd self-harmed and she said that Prince Charles would have difficulty adjusting to being king. So this was a lot of information that had never been heard by the public before. It was really a shocking interview and uh, before this point nobody really knew what was going on for Diana. She was always putting on a brave face in front of the cameras. So Earl Spencer, Diana's brother, showed the bank statements to Diana and then he introduced her to Bashir. So it's quite clear that there was a, a definite link between the bank statements and Diana meeting Bashir. When Martin Bashir won TV Journalist of the Year, I was really pleased. I really liked him. He seemed like someone who was intelligent and warm and um, you know, really wanted to hear the truth. Someone who was listening to Diana, someone who really wanted to know what she actually had to say. You know, that, that was, of course, in reality, this was an amazing opportunity for him and his career. And things really changed drastically for him after this interview. That was when things started going really well for him. So, um, so you know, it was really in his interest to do the interview. But it seemed, from my point of view at the time, that he was finally the listening ear that she needed. So I had a great impression of him, but 
it seems that he wasn't the way he came across. Diana's ex-bodyguard Paul Burrell has said that when he was on the phone to Martin Bashir, Diana came home and listened into the conversation and he would apparently regularly ring Paul Burrell and try and get information from him about Diana. And during this conversation, he was moaning about how he wasn't hearing from Diana and he didn't know what was going on. Where is Diana and um, you know where's she been going? which boyfriends has she been meeting with and the whole thing felt quite sordid to Diana you know I think she felt like this was this other side of him that she'd never seen and he just wanted all this gossip on her to help his own career so he just sounded really different you know quite um, pushy and disrespectful of her and it was a real shock to Diana to hear him talking in this way so she apparently was crying his charm really blinded a lot of us, I think. And now we're seeing this other side. We're seeing somebody who was actually really quite ruthless, who had no integrity and who wasn't bothered about the impact that this would have on Diana to really, you know, bear her soul on national TV and, um, and talk about things that she presumably would never have talked about if she hadn't been told these lies. He's not bothered about that. All that matters is his career. And yet he's really good at pulling off this very thoughtful, considerate um, and pleasant persona. But although Martin Bashir has said that what he did was stupid and regrettable, he's also said that it didn't lead to him interviewing Diana and that it had nothing to do with it. And since then, he's added that it also didn't make her feel paranoid in any way. So, so he said, yes, I did this and it was a stupid thing to do, but at the same time, it was completely harmless and, um, you know, and, and it didn't have any of the consequences that would obviously be consequences. So, and the excuse he's given, you know, the reason he's given as to why nothing happened to Diana that was negative because of his actions are that he and his family loved Diana. So as a result, it means that he didn't do anything wrong towards Diana. And, and it got me thinking this about how, you know, because when you look at that, it's the whole thing is so irrational that you would think that it would be quite embarrassing to make a statement like that, you know, to kind of say, here's my reasoning and it clearly makes no sense. You'd think that that would make you look really stupid. When this was initially investigated by the BBC a year after the Panorama interview, Martin Bashir gave his version of events. He said that Diana had spoken to him and said that she'd discovered someone was being paid for information on her and that Bashir had, as a result, asked somebody to mock up a bank statement and the reason was that way they could have a record of what Diana had said. He went on to say that Diana had then taken this back and said she'd been wrong and nobody was trying to get information on her but that he had shown this document to her brother Earl Spencer amongst other documents and that he'd forgotten to tell him why the bank statements had been created. None of this makes sense. Bashir hadn't met Diana when he got the bank statements mocked up. So how could she have told him that somebody was being paid for information on her? No program was being made about Diana at the time and nothing had been planned. So why would he need mock-ups of bank statements? Why would he need a record of that information in that form? Calling them mock-ups wasn't accurate. The designer spent several hours on them working through the night night and they were very well crafted. Bashir had told him that he needed to drop everything because this was a really urgent job and because the designer had told him it would take him the whole night to do this work, Bashir had arranged that they would be couriered to him at the airport just before he went to visit Earl Spencer. He told her brother that Charles's secretary was in on this, that he was also being paid for information. And when he met Diana, he added to the list, he said that her own secretary was also guilty of this. 
So there was no one for her to trust and suddenly she was doubting everyone. In the interview, he asked Diana this question. Do you really think a campaign was being waged against you? And Diana replied, yes, I did. Her answer wasn't surprising, seeing as he had just persuaded her that a lot of people she thought she could trust were actually against her. During this initial investigation by the BBC, nobody noticed that the dates didn't make sense or that he hadn't met Diana when he said she'd given him the information. But they did notice some strange things. So, for instance, somebody thought it was weird that he had got them made in the first place. It didn't really add up. And somebody else was concerned after the designer had been himself really concerned about whether Diana had been shown these bank statements and did the interview as a result of misleading information. So because of that, they asked Bashir to get proof that Diana hadn't done this interview because of something false that she'd been shown. So Diana wrote this letter. But the reality was that Diana's brother was the one who'd seen the bank statements and that Diana's brother introduced Diana to Bashir after having this conversation with Bashir. And not only that, but that the meeting was specifically about Bashir telling her brother about how people were being dishonest about how they were um, spying on her behind her back and so on. And he'd made that clear before he met Earl Spencer. Nobody bothered to talk to Earl Spencer about this and ask for his account of what had happened. And he himself was dubious about Bashir's stories. So initially he believed what Bashir had to say. He didn't know that the statements weren't real. So he believed that this was genuine evidence. But when he introduced Diana to him, he got suspicious about some of his stories and he warned Diana that maybe he shouldn't be believed. The graphic designer who had initially made people at the BBC aware of his concerns over why these bank statements had to be produced was blacklisted, which means that the BBC never gave him work again. And nobody asked him for a detailed account of what had happened. After reading Diana's note, the investigation was over. Why did they swallow a story that made no sense and not investigate it further? Steve Hewlett was the Panorama editor at the time and after Bashir had been asked three times and each time denied it, he finally admitted to Hewlett that he had shown the bank statements to Earl Spencer. Bashir also admitted the reason he did this was to foster a relationship with him. He only admitted to doing it after a tabloid was about to publish an article about fraudulent documents being used to get Diana to do the interview. So he was probably worried that Earl Spencer would say something about the bank statements. And Hewlett had spoken to Earl Spencer, who had said that the reason he put Diana in touch with Bashir was because of serious allegations he'd heard from Bashir. So Hewlett knew the bank statements were fake, but he didn't ask Spencer if he'd been shown the bank statements and he didn't ask him what Bashir had said to him. John Ware is a BBC reporter who's written at length about all of this. And he says, having worked closely with him, the idea that he might have colluded with Bashir in using fake bank statements is to me unthinkable and nothing I have seen suggests that Hewlett did. So why didn't he ask? Was it because he trusted Bashir despite knowing he'd lied repeatedly? Tony Hall was the director general of the BBC at the time. And Tony Hall also knew that Bashir had lied three times about showing the bank statements to Earl Spencer. A statement written by Hall for the BBC Governors Meeting in 96 quotes him as saying that Bashir's explanation for having commissioned the graphics was simply because he wasn't thinking. And Hall said, I believe he is, even with this lapse, an honest and honourable man. He is contrite. 
He even said there had been no question of Bashir trying to mislead or do anything improper with the document. Lord Hall has recently said he was wrong to give Bashir the benefit of the doubt. He said he based his judgment on what appeared to be deep remorse on his part. So it wasn't that he was a good liar or that he could come up with believable stories. I think it was more that people trusted his character. And because they already trusted him, whatever he said was going to be believed. When a narcissist love bombs, they're aware that this is a really important stage of any relationship because this is when they secure the person that they're going to then rely on. So they need to do it really well. I think Martin Bashir was very good at love bombing. Once the person came to trust him, they would open up to him. And that was obviously very important to him as a journalist. But it was also important to him for getting his own way, for being really crafty, because it also meant that these people wouldn't um, question him. They wouldn't think the worst of him. It would be really hard for them to imagine that he would have had bad intentions. After Bashir won an Oscar, Tony Hall was talking about his abilities and he said that he was good at winning people's confidence. And Paul Burrell, Diana's bodyguard, described him as a kind, wonderful personality and said he knew which buttons to press to get the right answers. So because of what a narcissist can get during that love bombing stage, it means they're free to not have to think really well about every lie they tell. It means it's OK for them to be a bit irrational or a bit nonsensical because people have an emotional investment in them and they're not going to question every little thing. So that's why it does make sense that a narcissist will be more likely to say something nonsensical than they will be to admit responsibility because they're aware that it can work and that people will buy into it even if it's nonsense. Diana didn't take on board the warning from her brother when he told her that the things Bashir was saying weren't adding up because she felt a connection with him from their first meeting. He had encouraged her at a really vulnerable time in her life not to trust the people she did trust. And then he'd asked her to write a note to make sure his name was in the clear. And she had no idea that all of this time she was being duped. And I think the reason she was so upset at hearing Bashir on the phone was because she realised she didn't have the bond she thought she had with him. He was someone she had trusted and she realised he didn't actually respect her and the connection that she thought they had, they didn't have. This is one of the reasons why smear campaigns work and why narcissists who have a lot of power can scapegoat and a whole country can go against the people that they're scapegoating. Because even if what they say makes no sense, people believe it because they've already got an emotional connection with the person who's saying this stuff. Hitler's book Mein Kampf was apparently really badly written and didn't make much sense. There were a lot of errors in it. The book was about a sort of pseudo-science religion of how Jews should be hated and why they were less than other races. There obviously wasn't any genuine evidence for any of this, so it was quite nonsensical in that regard. But people still bought it, and I think that's partly because there was a lot of anti-Semitism at the time. But at least equally, it was because of how they felt about Hitler. Because when it was first published, not many people bought it. It wasn't very popular. But when he came into power, it became enormously popular. At a time when Germany was suffering and its people were in poverty, he was talking about making Germany great again, giving people pride in their country, having them feel like heroes. All of these copies of Roman architecture everywhere, like Berlin suddenly became Rome and they were all the Romans. They were all going to take over and rule successfully like emperors. You know, so he made people feel like heroes and uh, really proud of their country. rather than feeling ashamed and poor after losing the First World War. So in this way, they were being made to feel special. They were being love bombed.
Hitler acknowledged that his influence over women was a big reason as to how he got to where he did. He talked really respectfully about his mother who he idealised. And although he took away a lot of rights women had, he still talked about them in this idealistic way. And he apparently remained a bachelor so that women would be more attracted to him. He would put women in the front rows when he was doing speeches so that they could influence other people in the crowds. And because they adored him, they'd often convince their husbands to be more involved with the Nazi party. And so because of this emotional investment in what Hitler stood for and how he made them feel about themselves, a lot of the German public threw themselves in and devoted themselves to the cause and they weren't prepared for what was coming. In the end, a lot of child soldiers were created, children who had been part of the Hitler Youth. Initially, that was a sort of exciting version of the Scouts. But in the end, these children were being sent to war and witnessing really traumatic things. A lot of them didn't pay much attention to the rumours about Jews being deported and murdered because they were too swept up in this fantasy about Hitler. And some of them were so taken over by him that they actually found it attractive and appealing when they did find out because to them it made Hitler seem like a strong, manly man. More recently, other politicians with a lot of power have given numerous statements that really don't make any sense. And lots of people have been behind them anyway. And these people aren't necessarily stupid. They just don't look at the logic of what's being said to them because of their feelings about the person who's saying it. Some narcissists will give nonsensical reasons for their behaviour intentionally, so they'll actually try to make as little sense as possible in order to confuse people. And that works as well, because the more confused people are, the less they're in control, and the more control the narcissist has. If you look at uh, different political situations, you can see that people who do that are actually um, praised, you know, and have a big following. The people who go along with the crazy reasoning, who think the person's really great and just buy into whatever they say, even when it makes no sense, it can be really depressing. It can have really severe consequences. You know, it, it can be it, it can really be a very destructive kind of force when you have somebody who will never take responsibility and you have a crowd of people behind them who just go along with all the nonsense and don't ask any questions and who bash anyone who does. For obvious reasons, it can be hard to find that kind of situation funny. But if you can force yourself to find the funny side, it can make it a lot more bearable. That reminds me of um, Monty Python and um, the, the life of Brian <laughs> and, uh, and how these people are following Brian, you know. Look, you've got it all wrong. You don't need to follow me. You don't need to follow anybody. You've got to think for yourself. You're all individuals. Yes, we're all individuals. You're all different. Yes, we are all different. I'm not. Brian is a character who was born on the same day Jesus was, but is just a normal guy who's trying to get on with his life. He's got a very overpowering mother, and everyone seems to think he's the Messiah. Now you listen here! He's not the Messiah! He's a very naughty boy! Now go away! Who are you? I'm his mother, that's who! 
when his sandal comes off and he's running away, the whole crowd follow and they, they take their sandal off because they think, oh, that's what we're meant to do. You know, we have to follow the Messiah. This is what we're supposed to do. He has given us a sign. He has given us a show. A show is the sign. Let us follow his example. What? Let us like him. Hold up one shoe and let the other be upon our foot, for this is his sign that all who follow him shall do likewise. Yes. No, 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 the shoe is a sign that we must gather shoes together in abundance. Cast off the shoes, follow the good! No, let us gather shoes together, let me. No, no, it is a sign that like him we must think not of the things of the body, but of the face and head. The more that we can laugh at this kind of behaviour, the more it can keep us sane. There are these people who, in day-to-day -day life, regularly dish out irrational reasons. And if you push them for a rational reason, it doesn't make any difference. You know, it doesn't mean that they are suddenly going to say, OK, you've got me. You know, what I've said makes absolutely no sense. This is really quite embarrassing. Can I just have a bit of time and then let's talk about what really happened? You know, that, that never seems to be the outcome. He's been caught out. What he did was really awful. That's not funny. But it is funny the way that he thinks that his charm is going to mean that nobody is going to notice when he says something nonsensical. Yes, it will work if you like the person and you're using emotional thinking instead of looking at their behaviour and at what that's telling you. But if you do get into the habit of looking for the evidence of what someone's like, and not just going with your heart, then those magical glasses come off and it becomes funny that they think they can fool you with nonsense. The things that they will do to get out of taking responsibility can be hilarious. It reminds me of this scene from Fawlty Towers. Basil Fawlty is a character who runs a hotel in Torquay but basically hates people. But there's a guy who moved into a room on his own, so he got a slightly cheaper rate. And it turns out that he has a girlfriend, so he's sneaked this woman in. And Basil hates the idea of this, I think partly because he's jealous of their young love. So Basil wants to prove that there are two of them in the room. So he, he goes with Manuel, the Spanish waiter. So together they go into the garden and they get this ladder and he goes up to look at this couple, except that he gets the room wrong. So rather than admit his mistake, it's less embarrassing for him to do this really weird thing with the windows, to somehow pretend that he's somehow working on the windows. <laughs> so if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.